All right, Assalamu alaikum. So, welcome to lecture number 20 of Connect Metaphysics course. So welcome to lecture number 20 of the condensed matter physics course. And today we're going to look at some examples of the tight binding model. In our previous lecture, if you recall, we looked at tight binding, a one dimensional crystal atoms in which the lattice spacing was taken to be A and we found out a dispersion relationship for the tight binding scenario and the dispersion relationship which is the relationship between the wave vector and the energy is given by some constant minus two times the strength of the hopping parameter or the exchange interaction between uh, and between an electron being shared across uh, two atoms into cosine of Ka. And if we were to plot this relationship, this is what it looks like. Ka on the horizontal axis and energy on the right axis. And I'm drawing it in the reduced zone scheme. And here are my, here is my dispersion relationship. Really, it looks like a cosine curve. It is a cosine curve. This width is called the bandwidth of the band. Right? And uh, this process, by the way, repeats uh, onwards. So I could always uh, I could always move back to the uh, to the first Brillouin zone and so on. All right. So far, so good. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I forgot to mention in the previous lecture is that if I focus my attention on this region, which is close to the minimum of the energy, and this happens at k equals zero, if I focus my attention here, I can rewrite the energy in this regime as e naught minus 2t cosine k a, I can expand as 1 minus k square a square over 2. And if I open up the brackets, I would get something of this kind plus k square a square t over 2. Now, all of this is some constant, some constant alpha plus k square a square t over 2. Now, for free electrons, we know that the energy is given by h bar squared, a squared over 2m. So in, in the region that is close to the minimum of the energy, which is at the origin of the reciprocal space, the dispersion relationship, if we ignore this bias, this DC value, has a k squared dependence. So this region, which is looking like a bowel, has a parabolic dispersion relationship. And we could say that in this regime, the electrons behave like free electrons. The electronic excitations are similar to free electrons, albeit with a different effective mass. And that effective mass, which I can note as m star, can simply be found out by equating these terms here. And if I were to make this relationship explicit, I could write h bar squared k squared 2m star, this equals a square t k square over 2, which allows me to write m star, the effective mass, as h bar square over uh, h bar square over a square t. Which shows that this a uh, hopping parameter, the inverse of this parameter plays the role of effective mass for the electron. And this relationship will have the same dimensions, by the way, as of mass. All right, so the hopping parameter is a property of this one dimensional material which renders the electron's 
to have a mass-like behavior. So it makes the electrons massive. So this is a very uh, unique concept in condensed matter physics. So we look at some more examples of this in, in the homework problems and in homework number, I think seven, I've already given a problem that deals with uh, one scenario of this kind. Now we would like to look at how multiple bands can be formed. So the example here is of uh, a single band and I can extend this band to a higher Brillouin zones and then wrap them back into the first Brillouin zone. So the key is how do I construct second bands or higher order bands, third band, fourth bands. So we'd like to come up with an example that shows how such a scenario can arise. And the example that I've chosen is that of a diatomic chain. And what do I mean by diatomic chain? By the way, the algebra can get slightly messy here. So I'm trying to be as precise and accurate as possible. So a diatomic chain is a chain of two kinds of atoms or ions. Still a periodic arrangement, but now I have two kinds, A and, a and B, and so on. You might, might like to consider this to be uh, some kind of a polymer in which the monomer or the unit cell is a combination of two kinds of atoms, A and B. So like any other tight winding problem, I would first like to solve the Schrodinger equation for it. And I propose a, a trial solution. So the trial wave function that I can write, I can denote this by ket psi, is an orbital. Let me draw an orbital just very roughly by, by the symbol. There's an orbital attached to atom A, and there's an orbital attached to atom B, and the electron resides in that orbital, and there's only one orbital per atom. Okay, so the and there are two kinds of orbitals, one of the kind A and one of the kind B. So I can write down the, the wave function, the trial wave function as a superposition of the orbital N A and N B, where N is the index of the unit cell. So this is the nth unit cell. This is the n plus one unit cell. Here I have n minus one unit cell. And of course I have to write down C and A here and C and B here, which are complex coefficients. And I take the sum over all n's. So this is my trial wave function. Now with this trial wave function, excuse me, The trial wave function is uh, the Hamiltonian acts on the trial wave function. Here we go. Uh, but first of all, let's find out what the Hamiltonian really is. The Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy of the electron and the sum of potential energy. And the potential energies can be of two points, one pertaining to atom B and the other pertaining to atom B up over all the possible unit cells which I take to be capital N. Now let's have this Hamiltonian act on this wave function. So H acting on Psi or trial solution A plus VJA acting on sum of of these of the superposition. <clears throat> All right. Now, what I could achieve through this is the following: I could split up this into three terms: a plus v n acting on a plus all the v j's. The j is not equal to n pertaining to atom a plus all the VJBs. This is summed over N and I have CNA 
n a plus c n b n b over here all right now i have to be really careful as to what i do i just take this k plus b n a and if it acts on cat n a cat n a is an eigenstate it's an atomic orbital pertaining to the eighth atom all right so this is an eigenstate of k plus v n a therefore this allows me to write this as an eigenvalue equation with some energy e the energy of the eighth atom i put a prime on top of it for reasons that become clearer later c n a n a okay so this is the action of the green operator on the green state <coughs> plus i will have v j a where j is not equal to n acting on c n a n a and i will also have v j b s acting on n a plus i will repeat all of this uh, by acting on n b so i could simply do k plus v j a sum over j s excuse me that's why it gets slightly cumbersome j plus k plus v j b j all of this acting on c n b n b all right so now this is the action of the hamiltonian on on the trial state what i would now like to do i would like to take this ket and overlap it with m a so something that is belonging to the mth unit cell but of the type a now remember that anything that is on on m come is orthogonal to anything on n that is the assumption where n is not the same as m so two different unit cells have orbitals that are mutually orthogonal and within the same unit cell ortho orbitals that belong to a and the orbital that belongs to b they are also assumed to be orthogonal so we have to invoke this orthogonality relationship to keep our calculation simple so now what we could do is we could take the ket that i've written in this big bracket and project it onto m a now if i look at the first term here i can do this projection and the projection turns out to be now i keep this summation over n intact the projection is such that i get e a prime c n a and the projection of n a on m a will simply be equal to delta n comma m it's a conical delta function so this will be 1 if n equals m now if i look at the second term here so <coughs> c n a is just a scalar i'm taking the projection on m a sum over j which is not equal to n v j a n a all right so now let's investigate this term for the uh, for, for a minute if i if i now j is not equal to n but m can be equal to n so if my m equals n and j is not equal to n so what am i really looking at i'm looking at 
the expectation value of all the potential energy functions, all the potential energy functions. Uh, first of all, let's suppose M equals N, M equals N. Okay. So what that means is that I'm looking at the expectation value of the sum of the potential energy functions when the electron is in some orbital. But from the sum of the potentials, I'm excluding the index of the orbital in which the electron exists. So this term really as an A side, if I, if you give me the liberty of writing this term, this term is, so if M equals N, I can write this as M A, M A, V, since I'm summing up over all Ns, as, uh, summing up over all Js, so I can write this as V1A plus V2A plus, but I need to exclude the M. So I put Vm minus 1A plus Vm plus 1A and all the way up to Vna. So this is the expectation value of all the potential energies for an electron that exists in a certain orbital, but that electron is not talking to its own parent nucleus, rather it's talking to all other nuclei. So this for M equals N, for M equals N, this will give me some constant. Okay. For M equals N, it's going to give me some constant. Correct? All right. And and what does it and what does it give me for, for, for the other terms which in which M is not equal to N? Okay, it gives me some kind of hopping. But that hopping only exists when M and N they are at least in the neighboring unit cells. But look at the look at the chain. So I have a A atom and a B atom, an A atom and a B atom. So there is an index A here and an index A here. So this means that we're really talking about hopping between two atoms that are that have an intervening B atom. Now this is not a nearest neighbor interaction. This is a next to the nearest neighbor interaction. And we are assuming for the time being that these interactions are so small, so feeble, so negligible that we ignore them. Therefore, this term that I've highlighted in yellow only exists for N equals M. And in that case, this is equal to some constant. Okay, so now let's look at the other terms. Uh, by the way, <coughs> by the way, so let's move, move on here. Let's look at this thing. So if we look at this thing, this is equal to and I've taken the overlap on MA. So I have K plus J, all J's, VJA, NB, here this NB, and a CNB here. And then finally, I have to take a CNB, MA, sum over all J, VJB, and an NB. So this is my final uh, matrix element for the Hamiltonian. Now let me simplify this further. M A H Psi equals the sum over N. The first term is E A prime C N A delta N M. The second term is C N A also delta N M plus some constant. Let's call that V cross A. So it's not a hopping term, it's just a bias potential. 
Now, if you look at this term over here, this is at the atomic Hamiltonian. And on the left, we have an eigenstate of the of a Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian can act from the left or it can act from the right. Here, in this case, the Hamiltonian is acting from the right on one of its eigenstates. And when it acts on its right, the eigenstate is recovered. So we left with MA. Now we are taking the inner product of MA with NB, really. Now this is an A orbital and an and a B orbital, no matter what M and N are, this term is going to give me identically, it's going to give me zero. And I'm going to be left with just this term over here, plus C N B M A sum over J V J B N B. All right, so this comes out to be quite a simple uh, expression. Now what we would like to do is the following, excuse me. Since I'm taking the sum of n and we have chronic delta functions here, I can replace n with m a prime plus v cross a, n can be replaced with m okay, plus C N B M A sum over J S D J B N B. Now all of this can be simply called E A. C M A plus C N B. This is sum over Ns. M A sum over all Js B J B N B. All right, so things are <laughs> simplifying out a little bit. So now let's focus our attention on here. So what does this term represent? As in the tight binding chain we discussed the other day, M A sum over J, B, J, B, and B. Now there are different scenarios that are possible. Now I would like to draw the tight binding chain again. And I draw three adjacent unit cells. This is the nth unit cell. This is the next unit cell. This is an A type of moiety. This is a B type of atom. This is the n minus one unit cell A and B. All right. Now let's see what's going on. This is a sum of all potential energies, and this represents a hopping between an nth orbital attached to an atom B and an mth orbital attached to the atom A. So nth, this is the nth unit cell, and this is the mth unit cell. All right. So now let's suppose that nearest neighbor interactions are possible, and that each hop to a nearest neighbor occurs with the same amplitude, no matter whether it's going from A to B or from B to A, it's a, it's a symmetric exchange. And the amplitude of that hopping is minus T. And th so this is an assumption. So there are different scenarios. So if M is the same as N, which means that both A and B belong to the same unit cell, then I will have uh, so, so what could happen is that M and N belong to the same unit cell. So, so in that case, uh, I can write minus T delta N and M are the same unit cell. So, this electron can hop hop here. But the electron can also hop to a neighboring unit cell and it can still hop to an A atom. So a B electron can hop to an, to an A uh, atom either to the left or to the right. So this Kronecker delta represents the first hop and the second hop can be represented by another Kronecker delta. And this is when 
so if the hop is taking place from n to m here m is n plus 1 and n is m minus 1 so it's really a hop between n and m minus 1 okay so here, here you see n is m minus 1 this is the nth unit cell and the nth unit cell this unit cell is m this m decremented by 1 so n equals m minus 1 so i have this relationship uh, for for this term And for other values of n and m, this term is going to be 0. Therefore, what I figured out is I can express the Hamiltonian in, in quite a simple form. So h acting on psi and overlap on m a is given by a simple expression e a c m a. And then I sum up over all n's c and b minus t into delta n m plus delta n m minus 1. Now let's also get rid of this uh, summation sign. And I can do that easily because of the presence of these chronic delta. So m a h acting on psi now give me e a c m a plus minus t c n b. The first term is such that I'm summing up over all n's, but n must be equal to uh, m, right? So I replace this n with an m. The next chronicle delta gives me an n which is equal to m minus 1. So I have c m minus 1 b here. So this is my equation number 1, my first equation. Now what does this equation tell? It tells me that I have a trial wave function with the superposition of CMAs and CMBs. And uh, I have a scenario in which <clears throat> the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between the total wave function, the superposition, and some MA is given by the expression that I have in equation one. But this must equal the right hand side, the right hand side of the Schrodinger equation. And I can make its overlap with MA as I've done for the left hand side. Okay, so energy, the energy which I need to find, I need to find the dispersion relation, which means I need to find out the energy. This is given by the sum over all ends of CNA, NA plus CNB, NB, and I need to find the overlap with MA. So I just take out the summation sign epsilon. Now MA always is orthogonal to anything on B. So I ignore that. I get a C and A. And since both of them belong to A, I can write this as a chronic delta, delta M N. And I can get rid of the summation sign and I replace this with C M A. So this is really equal to the energy into C M A. So now I have an algebraic equation which describes the coefficient CMA, the complex coefficient CMA. Of course, it depends upon CMB as well because of the interaction between the A and the B type of atoms. So let me rewrite uh, equation number one. Equation number one is E minus EA CMA. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Let me go step by step. I have EA. CMA minus T CMB plus CM minus 1B equals energy CMA. Equation number one. So this is the general form of, this comes from the time independent Schrodinger equation. And instead of writing the wave functions, it's looking at the eigenvalue equations for the complex coefficients that constitute the coefficients for the orbital atomic orbitals and the trial solution is a linear combination of atomic orbitals this term here which we have uh, this term here 
is generally representing the on-site energy because it belongs to electrons that are in an orbital that is attached with a certain atom and there's no hopping possible. So this time term is generally called an on-site energy term. Whereas these terms, these are called hopping terms. This is quite a general scheme for the uh, for the for the tight binding Hamiltonian. Now, if I were to take the same H, let me change the color again. If I were to take the same H psi, and now instead of projecting onto M A, I projected onto M B, I could get a second equation, exactly in the same fashion. And that second equation I've done uh, while I was at home. And this second equation is E B T M B minus T C M A plus C M one plus one A. Sorry, so this is an A here. E C M B. This is my second equation. All right, so recognize that here I have a CM minus one and here I have a CM plus one because now an A orbital is going to a B orbital and that is to its left. In this example, a B orbital was going to the to an A orbital, which was to its right. So this causes this distinction of sign between, between these two terms, all right? So these are the two equations that we set to solve. These equations are nothing but the time independent Schrodinger equation recast in terms of an equation for the complex coefficients. Now, like any other problem, we would like to propose an ANSATS, uh, a solution that is, uh, and we'd like to see whether it works or not. So the proposed solution in this case is the following. CMA, I propose this to be EIKMA, but with some complex coefficient capital A. Now, this is a periodic function. It has periodicity A. So if K is changed by 2 pi over A, the function remains the same. Likewise, CMB also has the same periodicity. The the periodicity of A type of orbitals is the same as the periodicity of the B type orbitals. However, since the atoms are different, the on-site energies are different, EA is not the same as EB. An electron belonging to atom A will have a different energy in general than an atom belonging to orbital B. So you could have ionic compounds. One atom is of one kind, the other atoms of another kind, sodium chloride, for example. But this CMB is now the same form. So there's an A here, sorry. And, but it comes with a different coefficient B, capital B. Now finding these coefficients is tantamount to finding A and B, all right? So let me insert these values into equation number one and equation number two. So EA, CMA is A, E, I, K, M, A from equation number one. This equals, now let me, oops minus, here I go again, minus T, CMB, CMB is B, E, I, K, M, A, plus CM minus one, perhaps, yes, plus B, E, I, K, M, minus one, A, this equals E, C M A, but C M A is A E I K M A. All right, all right. So far, so good. So I can just take away these terms. Right. And I'm left with E A A minus E A minus T one plus E I K A P equals zero. 
like so this equation number three and similarly i can do this for the other equation and i'm left i will be left with ebb minus eb minus e one plus e i k a a equal to zero so i have two equations i can write them in matrix form and when i write them in matrix form it really means if i would okay so let's write them in matrix form One plus e i k a e b minus e. This equals zero. So, in order to find these values e, that really means I have to diagonalize a matrix, and the matrix is is this matrix that I've written in parentheses. All of this. But without the e's, so I diagonalize that matrix, which means that I can find a characteristic equation in which the determinant of the yellow thing is equal to zero. So that characteristic equation will give me the values of e's, which are the energy eigenvalues that I'm seeking in the first place. And if I were to do that, let's find out these values. So let's find out the excuse me. Let's find out this determinant. This determinant is. C minus E minus square one plus E minus I K A plus E I K A plus one equals zero. This is plus E A E A. All right, so this will give me minus t square two plus two cosine of k a equals zero. But then e e here as well. So I can simplify this further. Minus two t square one plus cosine k a, which is another two cosine square k a over two. This equals zero. And if I were to solve this for e, I would get this is a quadratic equation in the energy, and the solution for this would be e a plus e b plus minus. Big, big, big square root e a plus e b square minus four four t square cosine square k a o two. So these are my energies. So this is the dispersion relationship uh, for the energies and for for the diatomic model. So we really need to make sense of this. So before we do that, let's take a short one minute break. All right, all right. So welcome back. So this is our dispersion relationship. Now we would like to make sense of this, and and what does it really mean? The first thing that I would like to mention is that if in the tight binding model and the diatomic chain, if the on-site energies become equal, then uh, then this would really lead lead to some simplifications that. This becomes equal to two two times e a. This will become equal to four times e a. And then you subtract this from here. This will go away. Eventually, your energies will be equal to e naught plus minus two t cosine of 
ka over 2 which is the same as the tight binding monoatomic chain all right so you, you cover the same result the only difference is that instead of a you have an a by 2 here because now the periodicity or the unit cell length has shrunk by half because previously you had a diatomic chain but now this if this diatomic chain were to be replaced by a monoatomic chain the unit cell length gets reduced to half so that's why instead of an a you have an a by 2 anyway so so this shows that this dispersion relationship that we've derived is actually correct but also notice that we have uh see these two kinds of energies so all so straight away we do have an inkling of an idea that we are getting two bands here so now what we would like to do is we would like to try plotting these bands and seeing whether in the first Brillouin zone we really get two bands or not so let's see how this unfolds and in order to see how it unfolds i would have to plot the dispersion relationship i don't want to plot this by hand that's going to be really difficult so i would resort to uh, a particular software uh, i don't have Mathematica, which is my favorite choice at the moment because I'm using some borrowed technology here. But let me see if I could uh, move on to another software, which is uh, freely available. And it's a very nice software, Desmos. You might have seen this already. So let's see if Desmos works. So Desmos, oops, dot com. Let's go to the calculator. All right, so now what I would like to do, I would like to plot the dispersion relationship, but uh, for certain values of the energies and the hopping parameter. So let me write down the function that I would like to plot. So I would like to plot y, um, y is my energy that I would like to plot. This is just uh, the convention in Desmos. So my energies, let's call my energies E, uh, E is not a good thing, E is not a good name. So let's call it the energy one. So let's try and see if E1 works, E1, okay. But, uh, so okay, just, just a second please. Let's call this, the energy of the first, the atomic energy of the first orbit, let's call it, looking for a good name, uh, let's call it <laughs> EA. A I'm using elsewhere, so I just have to, for a, looking for a name, let's call it Q plus P is the second energy, the on-site energy for the second orbital. And then I have plus, and then I have a big square root, square root. And in that big square root, I have brackets, I need brackets. And inside the brackets, I need to write P plus Q. Let me see if I can do that, pull this off, P plus Q, and I need to square this. And uh, how do I square? Do I have a carrot here? Or uh, let me see if I can type in a carrot. So here I go, it's tricky. And then I have a minus sign. But all of this is getting out of the brackets. Let's see. P plus Q. Uh, 
I wish I knew more of this Desmos okay, square. Now I move out. Need to come down somehow. Minus. Trying to come down somehow. Mm. Oh. So, so, so last night I used I used my other computer. All right, minus four. Now I need an aesthetic four times. I need a bracket. I need P multiplied by Q. P multiplied by Q. And then I need a minus sign, minus four multiplied by a T, T square rather, T. And then I need a square. And then I need to multiply this with cosine and the cosine of k a over 2. So k into a and I need it divided by 2 and I also need to square this. Let's see if I can pull off square here easily. Okay, let's see. Let's see if this works. Now my P and my Q, I would like to put them as sliders. I need to put my T as a slider. And I need to put my A as a slider. And I need to limit my Let's see, oops, limit my a between minus pi. Uh, so my a is one, so pi over a. So I limit my a between minus, sorry, minus pi and pi. Oops, it's running automatically, sorry. What have I done? Don't want to type this over again. Sorry, I think I've lost everything. Is there a way of control Z here? So I'm sorry, I think I've lost most of it. I've lost the entire. So just give me a second. I'll bring this up back. I'll, I'll bring this back up. All right. So I figured out the Desmos thing. So here, what I've done is, let me be very careful. I don't want to make this go away again. <clears throat> In the top cell, I've written down the formula for the energy with a positive sign between uh, outside the radical. And in, in the second cell, I've written this with a negative sign. So these are the two solutions that we get for the energies. And I've used these symbols P and Q for the on-site energies for atom A and the on-site energy for atom B respectively. And I've used the symbol X for my wave vector K and my y is the energy because this is just a limitation for, for, for the Desmos thing. So now if I make the two on-site energies slightly different, see what I get? So on the, the graph that you see here is really, uh, let me see if the 
sharing is done properly here. Let me just check. Oh no, I'm sorry. All right. So here I've turned on the screen sharing now. I hope you can see all of this. So on the left column, I have a sequence of cells. The top cell represents the energy when I have a positive sign outside the radical. Uh, so this is my energy, by the way. So I've just made a formula for in Desmos for, for the energy dispersion relationship. So the two cells represent the energies, one with a positive sign outside the radical and the second with a negative sign outside the radical. My P is my on-site energy for A. My Q is my on-site energy for B. Uh, and I'm using some arbitrary units here. And I change P from Q. So the two on-site energies are slightly different. And this is the kind of relationship that I get. Now, in order to make this clearer, at the moment, I'm seeing the repeated zone scheme for this band diagram. But let me try to see if I can focus my attention on just the first Boulogne zone. And how do I do that? I'll give it a try. I need uh, to add braces here so that I can define my limits. So my limits are minus pi. And these are the limits for, oops, these are the limits for my A, for my a K, sorry, which I've defined to be X here. Okay, and I get this thing is pi. All right, so, and I need to do this for, oops, what did I do? I need to do the same thing over here. I need to be really careful in how I manipulate this. Okay. So I put in my excuse me, I need to figure out this thing. with a minus sign, minus pi. And then I go here. This is my x. And then I go back here. And then I type in my pi. All right, so finally. So this is my first Boulogne zone, and this is the band structure. Clearly, you can see that two bands have been formed. There is a lower band that is cusping downwards and an upper band that is cusping upwards. And if I, for once again, uh, make Q equal to P, this is what I get. The two bands touch. If my Q is different from P, a band gap is opened up. I can also change my coupling parameter T and make these band widths larger or smaller. For very small coupling constant, which is close to zero, I get almost perfectly flat bands. I can also get perfectly flat bands if my Qs. So if my uh, all right, so if one of my energies goes really, 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 really large, and if I keep, keep, if this keeps on increasing, if I keep on increasing this thing, so I don't want to take any risks here. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So if you observe here, one of the bands has gone really up. The band gap has really increased by quite a phenomenal amount because now the on-site energies are quite different. 
One of the on-site energy is 10 units. The other on-site energy is one unit. So this is representative of a very strong ionic bond in which the electron would like to reside on one orbital rather than the other. And this happens when the two elements that are forming the ionic bond have wildly different electronegativities, such as lithium fluoride. Uh, so, so this is the scenario and, and adjusting T changes the bandwidth of, of each of the bands. So let me bring back Q to a reasonable value. And so this is my band structure. Now having two moieties within a unit cell, that is two atoms, one of type A and one of type B inside uh, our uh, tight binding chain, we can have two bands, one a lower band and the upper band. And there's the possibility of a band gap between the, uh, between the two bands. So now what I've done is I've used the example of the diatomic chain to exemplify that multiple bands can be formed. If I had a triatomic chain, a third band could be formed. And this is the picture that you see in front of you. That's for the reduced zone scheme. All right, so I think I've been able to explain a, a, a few things here, but let me come back to my, to my screen here uh, and let me share my one note again. <clears throat> so in this example, uh, we can find out what happens when the two on-site energies become equal. We can find out when one of the energies is much larger. Me. <laughs> All right, so I, for some reason, this screen has stopped working for some odd reason. All right, so finally. So I could also find out what happens when one of the energies is much, much larger than we we, we saw in that case that the band gap really goes very high. This EG goes up. We can also see what happens when the We can also see what happens when T goes up or down. We can also find out the effective mass through the relationship H bar square over the double derivative of the band structure with respect to K. That is, we take the inverse of the curvature of the bands and we can figure out what the uh, Effective mass looks like and, and you can find out that in most cases it's given by E A minus E B whole square plus 16 T square divided by 2 A square T square. So this is a problem that you could do what your own. Now if you look at the bands here and I'm just focusing my attention on the first belonging zone. So this is pi by A and this is minus pi by A and suppose I have this diatomic chain and each atom is monovalent. Each atom contributes one electron. So one electron comes from here, one electron comes from here, one electron comes from here. So each unit cell is contributing 2n, two electrons. Now the total number of spaces, slots in this first Boulogne zone is going to be n, where n is the number of unit cells. And each K point, each of this K point, which is quantized, can hold two electrons. 
So all so <coughs> so the two electrons that uh, now now there are two n elect two n electrons that are coming out from this system because there are n unit cells. Each unit cell has two atoms. Each atom is monovalent. It's contributing a single electron. So there are two n electrons that are coming out. And all of these two n electrons will obviously fill up this band. So you will have an insulator. And if the on-site energies are really big, then this insulator will have a large band gap. This is the case for many ionic compounds. So, so n unit cells monovalent gives you uh, gives you a gives you an insulator. So these this tight binding monovalent metals in one D they will form insulators. So now once you have the band structure in front of you, you have band gaps opening up. You can count the number of electrons that fill up. Uh, these bands and if the Fermi surface or the chemical potential lies on the top of a band and there's a gap with respect to the next band then you get an insulator. So these materials here that I've depicted here is monovalent one-dimensional metals they turn out to be very good insulators. So this is a very nice example of uh, a diatomic lattice which uh, has a tight binding Hamiltonian and it leads to a very nice band structure that is simple to understand. The algebra is slightly messy, it's tedious, and I've tried to simplify this cumbersome calculation and make it uh, quite conceptual. I've tried to represent a graphical analysis of this problem. In the next lecture, what I would like to do, I would like to take this example to two dimensions, and I would like to look at uh, a square lattice followed by a honeycomb lattice, which is typical of graphene. I would also like to touch upon diatomic chains in which we're not talking about electrons, rather we're talking about the vibrations of the atomic structure so that we can actually see or motivate the concept for phonons. So I hope uh, this is uh, all making sense uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, I hope to see you on Tuesday, inshallah. Thank you very much.